Welcome back to the Western Bulldogs podcast, Barclay Street. Um, this is a genuine honour. Uh, I'm in awe of uh, of the man that we are about to speak to. Um, I think icon of the Western Bulldogs gets thrown around too loosely, and uh, but when it comes to to Dan Southern, I think it uh, it's a moniker that fits very comfortably on his uh, on his broad shoulders. Um, Iconic hair. We'll get to the hair a little bit later because it has uh, it has caused a bit of a stir amongst the Bulldog supporters. We'll get to that. But it is a great honour. Um, he's been very generous to come on and chat today. But Dan Southern, uh, mate, welcome to Barclay Street. Thanks, Murph. It's a real honour actually to be able to sit down and have a bit of a chat with you, mate. It's been a long time since we caught up last and I think it that uh, introduction was a little bit uh, of an exaggeration, mate. Just a battler from Old West who liked to slug it out down back with some of my teammates, but thanks for having me on, mate. Really looking oh, forward to the chat. No, it's a real pleasure for me. So you, you and I only had the one year together as teammates, and even that year was was kind of cut short. It was the year 2000. And, uh, and I mean, in my eyes at that time, because I was, you know, almost a prepubescent bloody little kid, and you seemed a... Uh, you were a real man. You were a real man's man. You know, you had hair on your chest and all sorts of stuff and tats and but you were but you were crippled by a by a, a string of injuries. But that that knee of yours really cut your career short, didn't it, in that year? Yeah, it did unfortunately. That year, Murph, I do remember well. I think we actually played a pre season together over in yep. uh, New Zealand in Wellington, which I remember That's right, finally we did. was a yeah, we yeah did. great opportunity to go and play overseas. The only time I had a game of footy uh, abroad, which was a, a really great experience. But yeah, just unfortunately, Murph, I um, yeah, had a bad knee, which I'd sort of hurt when I was 15 years of age. So I managed yeah. to get about 10 years um, of work out of it. But yeah, that season, I think we played seven games in a row down at the old Dockland Stadium or Marvel Stadium, as it's known now. And yeah, um, yeah knee was just pulling up a little bit sore. And I retired mid season. So I think I played the first eight games. Um, had some surgery and then, yeah, never surfed again, unfortunately, but just sort of yeah. took a toll on the body and just couldn't, I guess, mentally put up with the pain anymore, more yeah. than anything else. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I was thinking the other day about, I mean, the the modern footy, and I'm not sure how much interest you take in in um, in AFL footy these days, but this uh, this evolving sort of kind of, masculinity is sort of um, shifted the game a bit and, you know, vulnerability is the, the buzzword of, of leadership and, and where, you know, it's real strength comes from. And, and it sort of made me think about um, that era you played through that often the times you heard those sort of raw conversations were when a player was retiring. And I remember you standing in front of the group and then a few months after that, it was Billy Collinook and Scotty Wine in that year standing up and, you know, big, strong, grown men sort of just laying it all bare. And you sort of got to see inside the heart of a player and almost see the little, the, the child of, you know, and their pure love for the game. And that, but that was the, that was the little glimpse you got. Whereas I think now players sort of seem to share that a bit more often. You got a kind of a view on that? Yeah, it was very much a, a man's sport back then. And not that it's not now, but, you know, there was yeah. that masculinity um, sort of connected to the game. And, you know, you had to try and bring that sort of attitude, or I did, particularly in the facade yeah. that I sort of um, persona, I used to try and portray a sort of hard, yeah, the, tough, the tough sort the of armour on. Yep. Backman. Yeah, exactly right. So, but but in, a, in a, and amongst and underneath all that, was, you know, I was pretty sort of, I guess, um, emotional, I guess, uh, man. Um, yep. You know, and I wasn't afraid to, to, to cry in front of my mates. And, yep. um, you know, that, uh, that journey into, I guess, retirement was, um, yeah, it was a really difficult sort of stage to go through. And, um, you know, I think we we're pretty open about the way we felt about it. And, you know, playing AFL footy was a dream of mine since I was five years of age. And to have it yep. sort of taken from me prematurely at the age of 25 was um, really difficult sort of time in my life. And I actually really struggled yep. for a couple of years post sort of footy career just to right. find a bit of an identity or a, a new yep. sort of chapter in my life. But, yeah, you, you do mention it these days, you see, as you, as you expressed about the leadership these days, about being vulnerable and um, I guess being authentic. Um, you know, they're all the big catch sort of words around yeah, the industry they, these days. They've almost, is, they've almost been ruined a bit in a way because they kind of get overused, but it, it has been quite a bit of a shift, hasn't it? 
Yeah, definitely. And which I think is great because, you know, yeah. as men, and you look at mental health issues we have sort of, not just through the AFL industry, but throughout sort of society, it's, um, mm. you know, it's a big um, problem we all face. And, um, you know, as a, as a man, you often feel like you're, it's a sign of weakness to go and sort of, you know, seek yeah. out help or get some, um, you know, some feedback from somebody else. But, you know, I can sort of honestly say that, you know, after that sort of transition from my playing days, I actually went and spoke with a psychologist. Remember yeah. Peter Kramer? It was Peter Kramer. Yeah. I'm not sure if you crossed paths uh, I, I know with the Peter, name. But... No, I know the name, but I didn't cross paths, yeah. Yeah, so he was a psychologist at the footy club for a period of time and then was working with the AFL Players Association. And um, just knowing Peter on a personal level, I felt sort of comfortable just going, and just offload and just get things off my chest. And it was the best thing I ever did, Bob, because it yeah. gave me some clarity and sort of a bit of a direction to move forward in the next chapter of my life. And I'll yeah. put closure on footy because I don't think you can ever – close a door on footy, it's just a passionate tribal game, which once it's sort of within yeah, you, it's yeah. hard to sort of get it out of the yeah. system. And, you know, I still, yeah. every, every, every game of footy I watch, I wish I could be out there running around having a kick and, yeah, you know, yeah, I get yeah. super envious of, you know, grand final day. That's, um, I guess, when you're at your worst and best because it's, you know, great to see people achieving <laughs> uh, amazing sort of things on a footy field. Yeah. But on a personal level, you sort of wish you had that opportunity to actually live the dream. Well, I think if I'm right, I'm just looking over your shoulder now. Is there a couple of spears on the wall behind you? So the, the warrior spirit still seems to reside in you pretty pretty obviously, Dan. Yeah, it is, Murph. I should actually pick a different uh, offer still. No, no, no. Not at all, No, mate. yeah, they're just a couple of spears that I picked up in some of my travels to Kenya. Um, I used to be pretty fortunate. The club were very supportive of my uh, exploits of travelling overseas. Yep. So I'd often go for sort of eight to ten weeks um, in the in the yep. postseason every year, go travelling, and those spears there. I, the top one there is more of a ceremonial type sort of um, Maasai spear, which they sort of wear more just for for dress. And the yep. one below it was um, a spear that I actually traded with one Maasai warrior. Yeah, apparently he killed a lion with that, which is a rite of passage to to manhood. And I actually traded it with him many years ago. Remember the old instant cameras that you get sort of one roll of film they cost you about twenty <laughs> yeah. bucks. You had to go and get them processed. So I was traded at one of them, which was a a bit of a rip-off and a couple of pairs of old dirty socks for his spear, which he got out of his hut, his manyatta, which was um, a pretty special thing for me. So, yeah, it lives up there on the wall, mate. I love them. Did you tell him? He said, he goes, oh, I killed a lion with this spear. And you said, well, I actually nearly killed a couple of eagles back in the uh, 90s. <laughs> well, that is true, mate. And I, I can never escape that, Bob. It's just something that keeps us 27 years ago now, that particular yeah, yeah. instance with Peter Sumich, which is, um, it just rears its head all the time. It's something that... Yeah. Um, I wish we'd go away, to be honest with you. It's just yeah, one yeah. thing that just keeps getting brought up. And living over here in Perth, it's it's a, a constant reminder, almost daily, someone will bring it up yeah, in yeah. conversation or, you know, yell it out from across the road. Or even I was walking past a butcher the other day and heard some heckling come out of, out of the shop front. So it's sort of one of those unfortunate incidents that did happen on footy field, which I'll be remembered, I guess, yeah. um, for life. Yeah, which is yeah, well, a sad thing, but it's uh, well, reality. Well, 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 you remembered for a lot more than that, mate. When when you do think of the your time at the Bulldogs, um, are they happy memories? Because, uh, I mean, I wasn't there for for most of your career, but my memory of you as a young kid was that as soon as you became a Bulldog, you, you were just beloved. That the 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 working class traditions of the Bulldogs supporter base just took you into their under their wing right from the very first moments. Did you did you feel that as a player? Did it sort of fill your fill your heart? Yeah, very much so, Murph. I was um, really fortunate. I love the Bulldog supporters. And as you mentioned, they really did embrace me um, right from day one. I guess I was pretty fortunate in the situation that when I did come over to Melbourne, I was, I was ready to go. Uh, I'd played a bit of waffle footy here, so I'd played with men. And my first season in 1994, I played every game of the year and a couple of finals. So I played 90, was it 24 games that year. Uh, yeah. But the, the supporter base of the Bulldogs, I guess they, um, I, I guess they really aligned... To me, just because I, I was, you know, we talk about that word authentic, but I was just being myself, you know, I was a young yeah. sort of knockabout kid that was living a dream and, you know, I was very fortunate to you know, be in a position I was to be able to play AFL footy and, you know, I used to drive around in an old hotted up one tonne ute with a 350 Chev and I had pit bulls and I <laughs> had the mullet and you know, a couple of tattoos and I guess they could see themselves in me, some of the supporters. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, they were just super supportive of, of me throughout my career. You mentioned that Peter Sumich incident before, but, you know, I got fined $10,000 for that incident back in 1994, That's which was, unbelievable. I guess, about 25% of my salary. So if you put it to modern terms, you're probably looking at 100000 yeah. really. 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was uh, a huge fine. And the actual supporters went and did a tin rattle and actually wanted to pay my fine for me. So that was just shows you the heart of the, the Bulldog fans and the, the supporters have just been amazing. And, yeah. and, and ever since, even, you know, I've been out of the game for 20 odd years and whenever I come across a Bulldog fan, they still warm to me, which is just magic. And, it, um, you know, I was pretty fortunate. It's a special memories, mate. I loved it. every day I had at the footy club, you know, there's yeah. some highs and lows and, you know, it's a tough journey, as you know, better than mm. anyone, you know, there's probably more lows than there are highs in amongst yeah, it. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, throughout that journey, the Bulldogs um, supporters um, stood by me and they, it was nothing better for me on a personal level than to get to the 2016 grand final and yeah. get to see them rejoice and um, spend a bit of time in the sunshine. And that was a, a magic memory, um, which I'm really you know, thankful to be part of. That team that you were a part of, that you know, mid to late 90s um, Bulldog teams, it's, you, know, you didn't quite you know, win that elusive premiership, you know, got, got so close famously. But I was chatting to uh, Scotty Wind and Jose Ramiro last year and, and various other people. And it was just such a, seemed to me, it's such a curious mix of characters of competitive, volatile, tight friendships that was sort of, there was a tension in the friendships as well, though. But the two figureheads were Scotty Wind and, and Chris Grant, who were these kind of, you know, uh, Tough as steel, but very kind of serene and uh, people who had the power, you know, two players that used the power of silence as, as well as anything else. It was kind of this really unusual mix of, um, of team chemistry. Yeah, it was a pretty special group, you know, because we, we did sort of have all facets covered. As you mentioned, we had that sort of hard, tough sort of mongrel. We had plenty of guys that yeah. would go to the well every week yeah. and put the body on the line and do what they had to do and push the, I guess, the boundaries of the spirit yeah. of the game or the laws of the game to yeah. try and have the ultimate success. We had talent. We, you know, we had enormously talented players. You mentioned, you know, Chris Grant was one of the best footballers you'll ever see. Um, yeah. You know, you put Scott West in there, Rowan Smith, Brad yeah. Johnson, you know, Luke Darcy. We had a lot of high calibre blokes who could finish and use a footy. Um, yeah. And then we just had the guys who were just, you know, um, in between there, between, you know, just – solid citizens who, you know, yep. would just week in, week out, would just get the job done. And you mentioned Scott Wine, who was just inspirational, the way that he went about um, mm. his footy. You know, he was obviously injured um, really badly as well, had a crooked knee, but his efforts that he had put in week after week in the middle of the ground, you know, it wasn't just his ruck work, it was the follow-up yeah, yeah, and the yeah. second and third efforts. And, you know, the big fellow was on the ground more than he was actually standing up. And he probably doesn't get enough credit for his courage the way he used to fill the hole in front yeah. of, you know, the big boys like Tony Lockett and these guys. At Winey would just sort of prop up there um, week in, week out, just get drilled contest after contest. So it was um, in amongst that, it was some fiercely competitive, yeah. you know, players as well. You know, as you, as you sort of express, it was sort of very competitive within the actual team unit who was getting a game um, each week. And, you know, on the training track, it was always... Um, pretty spirited and you know there was often times where players would almost come to blows I think a few times they did actually yeah. um, have a few exchanges out in the field at training but it just showed you um, how competitive everyone was and how driven everyone was to try and you yeah, know yeah, get yeah, that yeah. ultimate success and unfortunately we just weren't quite good enough at the end of the day we got pretty close but you know luck yeah. wasn't on our side and yeah the rest is history I guess but we, we went pretty close. So as much as you were kind of built for you know um the Bulldogs in terms of a cultural fit, tough defender. And you were, you know, you were more than just tough. You were, you were a, a very bloody talented, skillful player yourself, which, which does get, you know, I think missed in, in terms of um, the reflection of, of your career. But, but I, I'm kind of interested by how you handled the constraints of footy at that time, because that was when it was going from amateur into professional and you were a man of, very, you know, many and varied interests and the demands of footy being what they were. Um, I, I kind of uh, interested about how you were able to balance balance those two and, and watching, you know, the, the Chicago Bulls documentary where Phil Jackson talks about Dennis Rodman being the, the backwards walking um, man in the culture. And I kind of, you're in a similar vein to that. And probably Tom Libertore a little bit like that in the modern times. How did you, how did you find that balance? Was it difficult? No, it actually wasn't that difficult, really. I was, I was just trying to be myself, Murph. And, and I actually 
Funny story, I actually left school when I was 14 years of age because I wanted to be yeah. a footballer. I couldn't understand why a jockey would go and do an apprenticeship and become a jockey. I want to be a footballer. Why wasn't that sort of career pathway for me? So I left school to try yeah. and focus on my craft and used to spend, you know, the days down at the school um, having shots of goals, riding my bike, working out in the gym, um, trying to do everything I possibly could to try and live the dream. So when it when um, the football did transition into being a full-time profession, for me, that was the you best thing ever. Go. I love training. Yeah. I love training hard. But, you know, away from that too, having said that I left school at 14, I wasn't educated in a formal sense. So, yeah. so for me to have that balance in life, I was, you know, I was pretty much a reclusive. To be honest with you, I had a reasonable profile in Melbourne at that stage and um, it was always hard to escape sort of, you know, being in the public eye. So I used to retreat to the local libraries. So I had a membership of the, um, the one in Mooney Ponds there, Ascot Vale. There was one down in Flemington. I even went further over to Richmond and Port Melbourne. So I'd pretty much spend all of my time away from footy um, researching and studying ancient cultures, um, wow. different sort of First Nations from around the world, yep, yep, um, yep. wildlife. You know, internet wasn't around back then. So the only sort of, um, I guess, information you could sort of seek out was in the local library. So I'd spend most of my days reading books and just camped up in the library just seeking refuge there, which was yeah, right. you know, great for my personal sort of education. And it just yeah. sort of gave me that balance. And I mentioned before, I used to love to travel. And so I'd sort of plan um, 12 months in advance what journey I was going to go on. As, a, as yeah. I expressed a couple of times, there was no internet. So, you know, you'd get a Lonely Planet guidebook and you'd get an encyclopedia and you'd get a couple other books and you'd sort of have a look where you want to go and try and sort of plan an itinerary and sort of make sure it was yeah. um, time effective because we only had limited time to get away. And then I'd sort of just look forward to that. As soon as the season would finish, yeah. I'd be on the plane and I'd take off for, you know, two, three months at a time and come back, refresh, recharge, ready to have another crack at it. So, so when footy finished, so you've, you've done, you've pretty much undertaken a bachelor of mm, like indigenous cultures and history and in, in an informal way, Footy finishes in 2000. Where did it take you? I, I suppose you've had to answer this question a few times, but what, what has the sort of, you know, the, the last 20 years, where, where have you been and, and what have you sort of undertaken? Yeah, so finished in 2000, Murph, and then I stayed around in Melbourne for four years post-career. So I did a little bit of work in the media then. I was doing um, some ABC commentary work. I was doing yeah. a couple of TV shows here and there on a Sunday morning with Rex Hunt and those sort of things. Yeah. and. Um, I actually tapped into the resources of the AFL Players Association. I mentioned I spoke to yep. psychologists, so I went down that path and I um, took an education and training grant. I went and studied tourism, so I went and yep. studied ecotourism. And on the back of that, I also did a work placement down at the, um, at the Melbourne Zoo because I love wildlife. And I, um, yeah, yeah. I was working as a zookeeper, you know, working out with the big cats and the ungulates wow. of the carnivals and ungulates of hooved animals. And that was a wonderful experience, but I realised that sort of 20 seven, 28 years of age at that stage. It probably wasn't for me. Yeah. And so I, 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 there was an opportunity to, to go and work in Egypt. So I, um, I applied for a job to work with Intrepid Travel, which is a Melbourne-based travel company, and went over and lived in Cairo in Egypt. And um, for three years, or three and a half years, I led tours. So I was based in Cairo and I run tours predominantly yeah. through the Middle East from um, Egypt, so Cairo, through to Istanbul in Turkey. So going yeah. through Jordan, Syria, wow. um, led trips in Libya, so that was just an amazing experience and it taught me so much about, about life because we'd have small groups, it'd be 12 people from all parts of the world, predominantly Australians, but um, sprinkling of different nationalities and to get them to unite and work as a team and for them to put trust in me because the Middle East has a sort of a volatile sort of reputation. Um, not all true. There was, you know, at times and places where you got a little bit hairy, but... Um, yeah, yeah, I bet. You know, so it ended often... I'd look at people in my group and just look at the group dynamics. I could see sort of different traits in individuals that um, I didn't particularly like, but I could see them in myself. So for me, it was just a great um, opportunity to grow and develop and learn as a person, as, as long as seeing, um, you know, some wonderful, amazing sites. So that was a great experience. And then I worked um, doing operations. So I ended up managing the North Africa and Middle East. I was about 13 countries, um, logistically, you know, a big headache, um, developing yeah, world, right. lots of issues, lots of problems. Then yeah. the Arab Spring went through and um, revolution in Egypt. So tourism died for a couple of years. So it was that stage that we decided to come back to Australia. So that was nearly 10 years, that whole journey, where wow. I went over with a backpack and came back with a wife and a kid, which was yeah. uh, not really what I was looking for, but that's uh, where life took me. Hey, and then I ended hey, up back mate, in Australia. Whether, whether it's in Egypt or Syria or whatever, 
that's that sort of thing can kind of sneak up on a fella, you know. One yeah, day you look at you know, <laughs> my rugged good looks and charms, mate. Like Reha, my wife, my sister, family, irresistible. Yeah, I don't know how, but yeah. So we're we're twelve years married now and got two kids, and um, you know we're oh, back living in Australia. And when we yeah. came back to Australia, I um a coach that I played under Jared Neesham uh, had started a foundation called the Clontar Foundation, which works yeah. with young Indigenous yeah. boys trying to engage well in education. Known, so. Yeah, so I got on board with them and went out to Tennant Creek and Alice Springs, um, ended up coming back to Perth where I was raised and um, worked with the foundation for, for nine years just trying to help the young men with their education and life choices and that was an amazing experience once again. And then yeah. um, just about a month ago, joined the um, AFL Players Association as a WA regional manager, so managed to get my back my foot back into footy, which I'm loving and so it's been an interesting journey, mate. It hasn't been a traditional sort of 20-year sort of ex sort of playing yeah, yeah, um, yeah. life, but it's been, yeah, full of amazing experiences. There's a bit of Bruce Springsteen about you. He tells this story about how he's um, he was born in New Jersey and born and raised and, and then he spent his whole creative life, you know, he, he describes himself, he is Mr. Born to Run, you know, he spent his whole life running away and driving away and going here and travelling the world and he says... I'm 65 now and I live five minutes from where I grew up, you know, like he's you get, the, done the, the full circle, the, the arc of full circle. So it's kind of in a way, you know, kind of, kind of poetic around, around how it has to be. Um, so it's pleasing to know that you're back in football. Cause I think, um, you know, I think football needs more, needs more free thinkers in it and, and people, you know, with, with a broader experience to help, you know, young players and young coaches, Kind of, um, sort of, uh, yeah, broaden the lens on their on their development and, and perspective on the game. Um, do you watch much footy itself? It, does the game itself still bring the passion out in you? Do you watch Bulldogs games? What do you make of this this uh, twenty twenty one version of the team? Oh, they're exciting, Murphy. Yeah, I love I love my footy, and I guess I'm. Uh, with two young boys, you know, my my oldest son, he's ten. He he loves his footy. He he's just. Um, extremely passionate about it. So he, he would watch every game if he could. Yeah, right. um, yeah. His mum's not so keen. And that, oh, you know, I don't really uh, discourage it, let's say. If the yeah. footy's on, I'm always keen to sit down and have a look. But, yeah, I, I love footy as much as I ever have. Um, a couple of years ago there, I probably wasn't as interested. I, uh, yeah. For some reason, the game had sort of got to a stage where it wasn't that exciting for me. Yeah, uh, but I, I think, think what they've done over the last, yeah. uh, particularly this season, where it's, you know, mm. it's high scoring, it's exciting, it's, Free flowing, there's still some good contests. You know, you see the big marks coming back. So it feels more really unpredictable. Exciting. It feels more unpredictable again, doesn't it? it feels like you yeah, get it does. One and yeah, which 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 I'm loving. And the current Bulldog team, yeah, they're just sensational, mate. I, you know, sitting at the top of the ladder, and I don't think we've ever finished a home and away season on top ever as a club. So mm. uh, that would be a great feat if they could um, tick that box off. But that's obviously just the. Uh, um, the entrance or the entree until obviously the final series coming up. And there seems to be something special about the group. Um, they've got that sort of mix now of experience and youth. And, um, yeah. you know, they're just so exciting to watch, whether it's, you know, Bont doing his thing in the middle or Norton taking the big hangers. And, you know, the back lines seem to be rock solid down there. It's just um, they've got a really good balance at the moment. You look at their depth as well that, you know, yeah, you can miss depth. one or two, you know, guns and, you know, you wouldn't even know they're out of the team because whoever steps yeah. in, um, does their job and so fingers crossed mate it could be um, something special in the cards and yeah really loving watching the way they go about it yeah they're, they're a fun team to watch and you, you can see they're enjoying themselves and you know footy's not always fun it's a as you know it's <laughs> high pressure high stress but when you when you know that everyone on the you know in your in your jumper is is redlining it and they've met the you know, they're meeting the bell. It does sort of put your mind at ease and you can enjoy the game. And I just get the feeling that this team has absolute trust in one another that they'll they'll meet the line and they, you know, they won't have guys go missing. So I think I think they are as close to having fun at the moment on on a footy field, which is which um, some positive results usually come from that. Um, we we do have to get to the serious business of this podcast, Sado. And um, so last week, um, Easton Wood, who's who's my usual co-host, but he had to be given the flick today because he, he's he's far too handsome. He's, he's got the <laughs> Disney good looks, and it was it's it was just not going to be good for anyone. So let's just we, we'll piss him off for a week. Um, 
but Good we job. did put it. We did put it out there for the um, for the bulldog supporters of who are the most iconic bulldogs uh, hairstyles over the years. And there, were, and we sort of threw up. There was a, a young Adam Cooney. There was a, a, a long flowing Simon Atkins mullet. There was the Aaron Norton version of today, which is like a lion's mane. Um, but but eventually we got it down to four. And, uh, and the, the people have voted. The Bulldog clan have voted in numbers. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just, um, just to build up the suspense, uh, coming in at, at number four was, um, was, uh, was Jared Grant, who uh, in his own words, Jared said, he goes, there's about seven mullets in this list and there's only one microphone. So he, <laughs> <laughs> he had the kind of, I, I'd, call it, I'd call it a reluctant afro on, uh, on Jared Grant, but he certainly had a few a few followers in third place was a very glorious modern um, flag bearer for the mullet in, in Bailey Smith. Um, and he came was, in at number three, yeah, did he? He came in at number three. Yeah. So that's, Ooh. that's the sort of quality field we're dealing with. Um, <laughs> My young fellow's got a mullet based on Bailey Smith at the moment. <laughs> Does it, he? It's sensational. Yeah, you'll oh, love well, it. I'll oh, have to try and get a photo of it over to you. <laughs> that's a lovely tribute. Um, number two, um, one of your favorites, one of mine, very unlucky to miss out, but uh, Gary Zimmerman and uh, you know could only be described as the love <laughs> child of Robert Dippier Domenico and Billy Crystal with the sort of <laughs> afro soft mullet with the um, the big the, moustache that goes with it, <laughs> yeah, the, with the statement moustache. But mate, not surprisingly, the absolute runaway leader, you dominated the vote. <laughs> now, I, I, I would. Out of respect for you, I, I want to know how, how you would have described your, your peak sort of mid to late 90s uh, thatch of hair. Well, how would, you, how would you describe it? Well, it's a bit of an honour to actually come in from that list because even just in my playing days, like Choco Royal, he had a decent sort of buffant looking sort of mullet. And <laughs> yeah, you mentioned too. Simon Atkins, the red-headed mullet. Like, it's hard Gorgeous. to beat the old ginger with a mullet. That was, that was gold. So to take <laughs> out the title is a, is a huge honour. How would I describe mine? I was, um, I guess I mentioned before, I'd like to study sort of First Nations. So it was a little bit of uh, Native American Indian. So a little bit of dances yep. with wolves, a um, little bit of Maasai, the warriors over there. Um, part of their rites of passage, they would actually grow their hair and, and get it plaited and they'd sort of tie yeah, it down right. the back, which sort of, so a little bit of the inspiration from the Maasai. Then there's that old school Aussie bogan sort of rat tail mullet mixed in there. So it was a, and it had the little ability. Tip, mind, little, tip of the hat, little tip well. of the hat, little tip of the hat. Yeah, you could, you could dress it up. So I, I sometimes I let it just flow in the wind when I was feeling a little bit wild and carefree. And then if I want to look a little bit more sophisticated, take a little bit more upmarket, I could braid it and um, go to battle like that as well. So it was versatile, um, definitely iconic. Uh, I, it was, um, yeah, a lot of people look back at old photos and get embarrassed, but I actually still, I still like it. And I wish I could um, grow it back. Mate. Unfortunately, yeah, a bit thin on the top these days, but... You wouldn't believe it, Murph. I, I, after the footy finished, I grew my hair completely out. And so I had it long for the next sort of seven or eight years. And I yeah. was living in Cairo, and you wouldn't believe it. Um, my wife ended up cutting my hair off because she reckoned I looked like, um, uh, I guess, like a genie with the wind blowing it up, trying to do the old comb over. So once that sort of comb over <laughs> got mentioned, I thought I'd better cut it off. And so I had a long ponytail. And um, yeah, right. my house got broken into and they stole a camera, they stole some jewellery and iPads, these sort of things, and they stole my hair. And you wouldn't believe it, the woman that broke into the house actually was a maid who lived upstairs because the owner of our apartment lived upstairs. Yeah, she right. had a key. So I managed to salvage and get everything back except for my hair. So it's sort of something I'm filthy about because it's never going to come back, but it's a true story. Got everything else back that got stolen except for my hair. So I don't know what ended what where it ended up. I was just hoping that no witchcraft or magic was done against me. So I'm spewing about that. Well, now I kind of feel a bit bad too because I feel like by bestowing this honour, we've actually raised the value of the <laughs> hair. And so we might have to troll the eBay um, search <laughs> engine just long, to see. long rat tail sort of anyway, <laughs> ponytail. It wouldn't uh, have been enough hair to donate to, to a good cause either, mate. It was pretty thin and pretty scraggly by that stage, but it was uh, as good as it got. Well, mate, the hair was um, much beloved by the Bulldog fans and they, and they showed their appreciation by voting. Um, 
And I, I know I can speak on behalf of the Bulldog supporters and, and all of your teammates who played with you and, your, and opposition players who played against you. Much respect. I only got one season with you, um, but it was a privilege for me. Um, I'm just so um, honoured that you would take the time to come on and chat with us on Barclay Street. Um, I love chatting to you know the greats of our club, um, and especially ones who've got stories like yours that are you know an inspiration for for young footballers out there, whether they be boys or girls, and um, you know warm the hearts of uh, of the Bulldog clan, mate. So from the bottom of my heart, thanks so much for coming on. I love to see you doing well. You're doing some great work over there in WA um, in the footy world and, and with these young people. So um, thank you so much, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Merv. It's really been a pleasure. And to all the Bulldog fans out there, let's um, hope that 2021's uh, a flashback to 16 and uh, 54. So go the dogs. It's been a pleasure, mate. Thanks for your time. Good on you, man. So much. So much love.